so let me just start with um, the introduction. A study of colonialism in global perspective starts with this journey. Take tram number 44 from Leopold II Square in Brussels to the end of the line, to the leafy suburb of Tervuren through the lush Forêt de Swan. The final stop leads to the Royal Museum for Central Africa. Belgian King Leopold II, um, mastermind of the colonization of Central Africa and its 200 million inhabitants, built this ostentatious palace that today houses the museum. The Congo Free State has nothing to hide and no secrets, he said. Uh, and this is what he once proclaimed, continuing, it is not beholden to anyone except its founder. And of course, this founder was himself. He was the sole owner of that colonial enterprise. Um, today, the museum possesses 120,000 ethnographic objects, the world's largest hoard of Africana. This includes an impressive collection of African masks, one of the great ritual art forms uh, of peoples in the Niger and Congo basins. African dancers don these masks in ceremony to expose and witness hidden truths and to make ancestral spirits visible. Now, these masks and the truths they're meant to reveal lie appropriated and buried in the belly of the Tervuren Museum, but also hidden away as if in a large tomb of secrets is the history of Belgian colonial war and atrocity and its ongoing social legacies in Africa and Europe. And I go on, I'll stop there, but I'll go, I, the paragraph goes on uh, to point out that there are, uh, there's a special class of uh, artifacts that are held or used to be held at least uh, at the Tervuren Museum, uh, which are actually human remains um, because during uh, um, uh, Belgian colonization of the Congo, there was a practice of um, harvesting the, um, the bodies of the colonized once they had died or were murdered in a variety of uh, forms of colonial violence uh, and, and uh, uh, transferring them to Belgium where they were then incorporated into the colonial science of Belgium in the 19th century. And so uh, some of these objects are in fact human objects, quote unquote. Uh, and this is a common story that we see across imperial um, centers uh, of Europe and the United States uh, and Latin America in terms of the collection of human remains. And that becomes a meditation for me about how the Imperial Museum, um, where I begin the story, is certainly a place of display and pageantry, uh, but it is also a repository of secrets um, and a, uh, a hoard, if you like, of um, misappropriated and malappropriated wealth, including the wealth of human beings themselves, their ancestries, uh, their stories, um, their family ties. Uh, and the part of the work of this book, part of my work in general, is to ask the question, um, what happens when we witness uh, this history? Uh, and what does it do to the tendency that I think many of our societies still have today um, to disavow, disown, deny, uh, overlook, erase um, the ways that these histories uh, still inform our present. So, you know, that's the beginning of the book. By the time that I get in the introduction to talking about um, what I'm up to, um, how I'm structuring the book, um, I try to show, and I, I, this is the work that I, I do throughout colonialism and global perspective, which is to make something that is quite complicated um, with many different sides and, and, and interacting parts to try to make it straightforward and simple. Um, that has been my overall goal. Um, and I, I think it is a, an important pursuit how to um, speak as simply as possible about matters that are in fact um, both extremely salient to our moment, but also very complex. Uh, and the way that I do that is to break colonialism and global perspective into four big parts, what I describe as the, the kind of the four engines of how this phenomenon, colonialism, which I see as a present, uh, a real and present danger in our world, just as much as it has been for the past 600 years and more, 
um, uh, I, I see that as being uh, having these four component parts, one being um, the modern form of capitalist war. And I have a discussion in the book about what I mean by capitalist war, how it relates to racial capitalism, um, where this capitalist, this form of capitalist war has come from. Uh, that's one aspect. Another aspect is what I call racializing rule, uh, a particular form of um, state operation that uses race uh, and, and racialization of, of comparatively differently for, for different kinds of groups um, in order to put groups of people in their place to manage them, uh, to often to sequester them, to uh, remove them often, um, even to eradicate them. I call this racialized rule and it's a, it's a, it's a feature of how uh, colonialism has worked over the past hundreds of years. Then uh, uh, the third dimension I speak of is what I call moral deception. Um, colonialism is not just about the material um, uh, brick and mortar forms, if you like, of uh, conquest and settlement, but it is also, of course, about what uh, takes place in the mind, how colonial power seeks to rule people's minds, uh, not just the colonizers, but also uh, the colonized, perhaps most uh, nefariously. And, uh, and deception is one of the most important forms of power that colonialisms have used over time. Uh, that forms another feature of the book. Uh, and, and the last part, the fourth uh, aspect, is what I call transformative resistance. But in fact, transformative resistance, the responses of the colonized um, plays out throughout the whole book. One of the, my interests in this book, although it's called Colonialism and Global Perspective, one of my interests is to write a book that's simultaneously about decolonization in a global perspective. Because from my study, in my view, uh, I see that while colonialism is an ongoing force, it is not something of the past, it is the, um, the system of power that we need uh, to understand phenomena like the um, New Jim Crow, uh, the uh, ongoing uh, attack on black life in the United States and in Britain and in Europe, um, the ongoing war on um, peoples of the global south. Um, it is also the case that uh, decolonization is an ongoing process. It is in fact as long lived and I would, act, I would actually argue decolonization is more durable and more powerful than the ongoing colonialism um, that, uh, that in fact uh, engenders it. Um, so, I, so as much as the book focuses on colonial processes and colonial power, it uh, focuses also on uh, the actions, the activities, the imagination, um, the decolonizing uh, performances um, and practices of the colonized. That was a very important part of um, how, I, how I worked through how to write this uh, book. So, you know, now that I've given you a, a little taste of what I'm up to uh, in colonialism and global perspective, I'm going to shift gears a bit to um, just show you a few slides um, because something I'm interested in, to, in doing in the book is to ask questions around what the archive is. What is the archive to write about colonialism? Um, a deeper, uh, a more general question, you know, how do we, uh, if we want to witness hidden truths, um, if in fact we're not uh, satisfied with simply strolling the aisles of the Imperial Museum, but we want to know what is hidden down uh, in its uh, um, occluded repository, how do we get into that repository? You know, if, in, in the way that I think of it, imperialism is in some ways the, the pageant that, that, that uh, often states want to have in the light, but what hides in the shadows? Um, and so as I write, um, you'll see that each chapter um, has, a, has a kind of an exploration of how do we witness what's taking place uh, in the shadows, so to speak. Um, and let me show you concretely what I mean by that um, through these slides. So let me get my slides up um, and start sharing. <laughs> 
So I hope you can um, see my slides. I believe it should be showing now. So first of all, just um, to give you a taste of um, some of the visuals in the book, uh, I, um, you know, I, I have a variety of maps where I um, try to show the global extent of the, the, the story of colonialism, which uh, we might say, of course, goes back thousands of years. Colonialism is nothing new, but at the same time, colonialism is something new, especially when we consider the rise of a new form of um, racial capitalist um, extraction that has its roots in the 1400s and has its epicenter certainly in the Americas uh, in the story of um, uh, the uh, um, dispossession and genocide of indigenous peoples, as well as on the other side, the forced migration, the enslavement um, of African peoples who were brought to the new plantations of the uh, new world. So I take that story and it's in some ways uh, located uh, in the center of this uh, image and, and also show the vectors of connection with other parts of the world since um, this is really about interconnected, interlocking histories of um, colonial force and uh, um, decolonizing resistance. Uh, and so it, it is a story about that the oceans of the world, the continents of the world, um, and I would also say the diasporas of the world, um, an interlocking story of the European diaspora as it intersects and interacts with African diasporas, indigenous and native diasporas, and Asian diasporas. Uh, let me see, to move on. Uh, by the time that we go forward to, for example, the beginning of the 20th century, um, the, the vast majority of the earth has been subjected to certain features of power, the ones that I described a bit earlier in this presentation, um, but now come to um, uh, take control, to conquer, to settle in a variety of ways, uh, not just the Americas, uh, but now large swaths of, of Africa and, and Asia. Um, and this is very much the story of our uh, 20th century. Now, we might even say that while the decolonizing, the formal decolonizing of, em of empire took place uh, in the 20th century, there are so many ways in which uh, colonial force continues now in more potentially more invisible ways, but not necessarily and not at all, in fact, in less powerful ways. Now, getting into that question about, um, you know, reading archives, of course, I'm a historian. That's my uh, training. That's how I approach uh, how I'm in this in this work at least how I'm approaching the theme. Uh, I'm interested in, if you like, uh, thinking critically about beyond the methods that I've been trained in, um, opening up the the parameters of what it means to to study as a historian and to find new kinds of texts. So here is a text that I read in the book. It is a chasuble or a uh, you know religious garb of uh, an Augustinian um, friar. Uh, who would have been active in the Spanish Philippines sometime in the 1700s. Uh, and I read this uh, artifact, uh, which I uh, had the opportunity to see in person in Valladolid in Spain, um, for its production history, because it was, in fact, uh, made by embroiderers in China, um, and it was made using uh, imagery and using iconography that um, speaks to its, uh, the, the, the Chinese manufacturers, the artisans who made it, as well as the new kind of um, global economy that was coming into being uh, at, this, uh, at this time with the uh, galleon trade um, and with the expansion of racial capitalism. And so in some ways encoded in this chasuble is in the way that I read it in the book, um, is a story of um, a number of different histories that come to interlock through the way that colonialism functions. Uh, here is another kind of artifact or document, if you like, <clears throat> that I read. This is an engraved desk, um, engraved by Nipmuc Algonquin artisans in the late 1600s. It's um, now on display at a, um, a museum in Natick, Massachusetts. 
and you can't see it in, in, in this image, but in the book, I have some other images that I share, especially of the, the back of um, this desk. This was a preacher's desk, but it was carved, as I said, by indigenous artisans. Uh, and what they did is they engraved into it a number of, of details that actually speak to their sovereignty, their cultural sovereignty, their spiritual sovereignty, um, and, and this gets to the theme of how resistance to colonialism um, takes place in a variety of ways, a whole spectrum of ways, from uh, what we can consider as, you know, the big acts, what we think of as going on to the streets or the general strike, to the very small acts, what we might think of as the choices that engra an engraver may make um, in a Christian preacher's desk. Um, and, uh, and so this, this gets to another important theme that comes back over and over again in the book, um, which is uh, the change of, of scale in how we think of both colonialism and decolonization. Sometimes we zoom out to see colonialism and colonial power working in its biggest forms. Sometimes we zoom in to see uh, colonialism, but also uh, decolonizing resistance taking place in very intimate um, in very intimate ways, sometimes in the gestures um, of an artisan as they are confronting um, the wood, you know, that that um, that they'll use for their uh, for their work. Um, that same theme comes through in this set of artifacts that I uh, read, and this is from a, um, uh, a home that is in Medford, Massachusetts, that used to also uh, hold enslaved people. It was part of the Royal um, slave plantation. And these are uh, game pieces that were fashioned from household objects. I, I use this in order to get to the theme, which is a theme that, uh, you know, I like so much in my book, I'm, I'm so grateful for the contributions of a very um, rich and extensive scholarship built up over decades uh, by writers and, and poets and, uh, and scholars. Uh, who have spoken about what colonialism and decolonization look like beyond what we think of in, in the most familiar in, or obvious ways. And so here we can think of enjoyment, um, relaxation, laughter, uh, game playing, uh, these most intimate uh, and interpersonal dimensions of what it is to reclaim our humanity, to recreate our humanity as a form of, a very important form of decolonizing practice of the enslaved, who would use these kinds of images, uh, these kinds of artifacts, these kinds of objects to play games in their own time, on their own time, in their own space, even as they lived amidst uh, the plantation complex. So that gives us, for example, giving you a sense again of, of, of a way that the book is trying to um, you know, open up different ways of reading objects, but also through that helping us um, based on traditions of scholarship to think about what um, resistance looks like in its broader spectrum. And here, if I can conclude with one last image, um, this is um, an image, uh, a drawing uh, done by uh, uh, a Chinese migrant uh, to the Caribbean. Um, and you can see, if we had more time to look at this together, that they're encoded in this is a whole imagination, both around how differences are being crossed amongst the colonized between, for example, the Chinese migrants and the Indian indentured migrants who had been brought over after the end of formal end of slavery to replace the enslaved. But also hidden in here is a story, a very beautiful story about the use of memory um, in which, uh, I can't point to it with my finger, but if you read the book or if you can see it while I'm speaking, there's a little vignette about one of the uh, migrants who is thinking, and there's a, little, there's a thought bubble that opens up that links him back to the family um, that he left behind. And so this, again, shows us the power of imagination, um, the power of the mind that the colonized have always known to use because colonialism, as I said, is, is an attack, not just on our material resources, but on consciousness. And so decolonization is a reclaiming of consciousness. And I find this a very beautiful depiction of that.
So those are some of the, uh, the images uh, and the artifacts that I, I use in the book. Um, and uh, I read them uh, not just as examples, but as what I think of as, as puzzles, things that we uh, can kind of explore together um, to ask important questions about how we know things about colonialism, how, how we know things about uh, how the colonized left traces for us, and how we today are in a place, in a, in a position uh, to eth ethically witness those traces and how that changes our own consciousness about uh, not just our present, but also our future. And so in that spirit, I'd like to um, read just now maybe a paragraph from the, from the conclusion of the book. And I'll try to save a minute or two at the very end to speak about something I, I cannot not speak about because it's so important to me, which is um, the, the social or the, 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 the friendships uh, that are behind this book. Whenever I think of the work of having written colonialism and global perspective, I think of people. Um, I think of um, collectives that I've participated in that have helped me get here. And I, 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 I want to kind of speak a little bit about that um, as the context for this book um, at the very end. But let me just read a, a paragraph now. Um, so at the end of the book, I write, um, W.E. Du Bois in Black Reconstruction of 1935 observed that when demands for progressive social change and wealth uh, redistribution are articulated, elites mobilize ideas about racial difference, cultural purity, and national belonging in order to break apart progressive blocks. Ideas about cultural purity, national security, and the fear of the quote-unquote mobile poor or the quote unquote foreigners are part of a tried and trusted bag of culture. During reconstruction, amidst the progressive political developments that ushered in elected black representatives to all levels of electoral bodies across the post-emancipation US South, the planter class went busily to work reconstructing the plantation order. The counter-revolutionary collusion of the plantocracy helped to arrest the people's democratic development. Jim Crow laws were put in place, including the codified and enforced division of social space between whites and blacks and the systemic deprivation of social goods to black people, including good healthcare, housing, and education. Gerrymandering tampered with boundaries of voting restrictions to hardwire the plantocracy's interests into the electoral system. This pernicious use of ideas about cultural, ethnic, and racial difference and the conspiracy of law and policy to shore up the interests of elites operates today across nation states in many parts of the world. And now the final, pair, final sentence, if the 20th century saw the spread of the nation state to the four corners of the earth, our 21st century lays bare the colonial intent of national elites to seek to prevent equitable social redistribution um, at all costs, including the perils or at the peril of our own self-destruction. So I wrote that paragraph, however, in the context of speaking about the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the I Don't Know More movement, an indigenous movement uh, centered in Canada, as well as a variety of people's democracy movements that are taking place across Africa. And so as much, again, as I see us living now at a time um, at a reckoning moment for colonial power, I also know and see through this book and through my study that we are at this wonderfully uh, and powerfully certain time of decolonizing uh, activity and uh, manifestation. So uh, in the end for me, this book is a very hope-filled uh, book. And I'll say in just the last few minutes, um, and this is the part that I can really enjoy uh, because it allows me to open up my own thought bubble
uh, and think about the friendships that have made this work possible. Um, you know, I, I've learned so much about what colonialism is through the collaborations that I've had with a group of colleagues at my own university, at Tufts University, um, colleagues such as Lisa Lowe and Kamran Rastegar and Amal Bashara and Kendra Field um, and others with whom together, uh, I don't want to miss anyone, so I want to mention Heather Curtis, um, Adley Murdoch, they'll keep coming. Uh, but together we formed uh, over the course of a number of years, a new department called the Department for Study in, in Race, Colonialism and Diaspora. We taught together, we nourished each other's imaginations, we learned together, and it's out of that kind of work that this book emerged. I remember one of the things that we, I remember uh, one seminar we had where we uh, were reading uh, about what Fred Moten calls the undercommons, uh, a space in which um, the common goods uh, are really shared by those who are trying to build new structures of, um, of space and imagination, especially in, in decolonizing ways. Uh, and I feel that this book kind of, for me, comes out of my experience of the undercommons in, in a very powerful in a very powerful way. I want to think also about friends uh, at the Radcliffe Institute um, when I was there in 2015, which marked uh, an important period for writing this book, um, who uh, together again formed a kind of community, all of us coming from a different kind of slice of this puzzle. Some of us uh, critical indigenous scholars, some of us critical black studies scholars, some of us uh, you know, um, critical global studies folk, um, some of us anthropologists, some of us political scientists. But I remember in that group again feeling that we were doing something that <clears throat> I, I have now taken to be part of what this book is for. And I, I use the word parallax in the book. I explain what I mean by that um, in the introduction. I speak of it as obtaining what I call the multiplied perspective, a perspective that uh, is able to kind of turn complex matters in different ways and see interconnections in the pursuit of solidarities, in the pursuit of, uh, you know, important, urgent solidarities for our time. And so I want to think about that group too. And one final group I'd like to mention in these past years, and that relates to new work that I'm doing, especially on the reparations, uh, the global reparations movement, I've learned so much about what it means to be a, a current day decolonizing scholar activist through uh, folks that I have met through the global reparations movement. Uh, I think, for example, of people in the Caribbean, Hilary Beckles and Vereen Shepherd, uh, who point out that the 21st century is the century for repair. If not now, when? We, are, we have shifted already into the reparative mode. Um, and uh, and there are great things on the horizon uh, as consciousness changes to realize that uh, we today have to first reckon with the ongoing damage before we can move truly to you know, peace in the future. So I, I, I'm grateful for the, the Caribbean insights that have fed into this book, as well as the folks in Europe. Uh, I think of grassroots activists in the United Kingdom um, especially um, Esther Sanford and um, Kofi Klu and others who I've learned for, learned from, who are not located at universities, partly because of the racial hiring that is so rampant uh, in the United Kingdom today, where there's so few black scholars. Um, but these scholars, who are also activist scholars, are nonetheless on the streets, organizing people, uh, trying to change consciousness and changing consciousness through their work. Um, and I could name a, a number of, of other such um, collaborators uh, and teachers who I've had, both inside and outside the university. And so for me, all of that kind of feeds into why this is a special book for me, Colonialism and Global Perspective. Um, and I hope that you'll um, read it. I hope you'll check it out. If there are parts of it that you enjoy, I hope you'll share it with others. Um, because I think uh, one thing I believe for, for certain is that uh, the decolonization that we need is the decolonization of our spirits, of our minds. Um, and we all have a part to play in that. So I'll end with that. And uh, I'm ready for the questions. Chris, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for a really fascinating talk. Um, I have forwarded the questions on to you. Um, do you see them in the, in the questions box? I do. 
um, I see part of them. In order to get the whole question, do I click on it or maybe? I only see a kind of truncated section of it. Uh, there should be um, a box in the top right hand corner, which should open open things up a bit more. Um, okay. A box with an arrow. Um, I'm, I'm having trouble seeing them. So why don't we switch to our backup then, Lauren? Do you want to read them to me? Of course, yep, no problem. Um, okay, so uh, question one, can you speak more about your perspective on the relationship between colonialism and capitalism? Sure, I'll, I'll speak briefly on this um, because I don't want to get too deep into, uh, you know, um, a lot of detail right now, but I, 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 I want to focus maybe on some, some big concepts. One of them is when we speak of racial capitalism, for me, what is important in this concept is the observation that we're speaking about a form of relationship. Um, it is a dysfunctional form of relationship, but a relationship nonetheless. Um, racial capitalism, we can think of, and I'm drawing here on, on others' important work, um, for example, Rufi, um, uh, um, from, uh, um, I'm blanking again on, on, on a name, Gilmore, I'm sorry, Ruthie Gilmore, um, who works on the prison industrial complex. But what uh, folks like Ruth Gilmore uh, show us is that capitalism is based on a relationship on which um, the uh, making certain groups vulnerable or making certain groups um, uh, more insecure uh, and even uh, making groups more vulnerable to death itself uh, is used as a way of rendering other groups more secure, of garnering for other groups more accumulation, of making it more available for other groups to attain wealth. So wealth production, this is the key point, wealth production under racial capitalism does not take place in a vacuum. It does not take place uh, in a, uh, a fair market. Under the form of, under racial capitalism, which is uh, a form of, of society and economy and, and political economy that has emerged over hundreds of years, there's a relational link between the accumulation of some and the dispossession and the rendering vulnerable of others. That's the relationship that often gets occluded or, or needs to be witnessed. Uh, and we can think of that in one other way uh, that, that, that I find very kind of interesting, which is thinking about um, how colonialism relates to what we can call overrepresentation. So um, the, the fact that racial capitalist economies <clears throat> are ones in which uh, generally uh, white communities are overrepresented in terms of their needs and their safety and their security vis-a-vis -vis racialized communities. Um, but this also goes beyond you know, the, the, the construction of whiteness, um, which has happened through hundreds of years um, of colonialism. We can even think of how under modern conditions, the overrepresentation of the human um, or human needs vis-a-vis the needs of other forms of the needs of other forms of life, other kinds of life, and what their needs are, um, life that is beyond human life. And so, what colonialism does is it overrepresents. It uh, takes a, a subgroup and makes this group, this subset, into the stand-in um, or the uh, the overrepresented group for the whole. And through that is where the process of deception also takes place, because when overrepresentation is complete, then uh, questions of equity, questions of uh, the equitable distribution or redistribution um, of resources uh, cannot really be asked, cannot really be addressed. And so to ask questions around decolonization when it relates to capitalism or our economy doesn't mean to me or to my mind to be asking questions about necessarily the, the destruction of the capitalist order, but it does mean that we have to ask questions about the full reconstruction of the capitalist order, moving away from ideas based only on individual benefit to community benefit, to communal benefit. Um, and, and 
is there a new form of, of decolonized economy um, that we in fact must uh, fight for in order to preserve ourselves, you know, as, as, as humans on this earth, but also to preserve our earth, given what we see happening through hundreds of years of extractive racial capitalism, uh, which in fact leads to, um, to the point where we are now, especially the environmental crises. Thank you. That, that's my answer to that question. <laughs> As you can, I can get carried away. So, uh, you know, so be, be prepared. Yeah, go no ahead. No problem. Um, OK, so question number two. Um, is oh sorry um so there's one specifically on the desk the image you showed us do you see the engravings on the desk as part of an indigenous writing system in its own right i love that question um it is something that i speak about in an earlier chapter before i get to the desk uh, but i do i am interested and i do have um some some writing on this in the book about indigenous writing systems um, about the encoding of culture and sometimes and what we can even think of as some of the um colonial uh prejudices um that uh that that inform or biases that inform how we even think of what it is to write at least you know in a kind of everyday sense and so i i agree i i think that's a great way of thinking of of what these artisans were doing they were they were inscribing they were writing they were recording they were creating an archive of knowledge to be passed on they were passing on culture and tradition that itself is the definition of what it is to to write they were producing they were producing culture and performing it um, through this kind of what we might call um, uh, you know a, 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 a low frequency form of colonial resistance and that, that idea of low frequency resistance draws of course on Saidi Hartman's work someone I'm very inspired by um, so and this this question allows me to also just mention one other thing which I, I haven't said yet something I'm interested in doing in this book is uh, thinking through colonialism as an uh, an interlocking system of on the one hand uh, indigenous dispossessions and resistances. On the other hand, the natal and alienations of uh, slavery and the plantation complex, and then also uh, the form of capitalist war that uh, was exercised, especially on Asia um, in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, and the, the Asian diasporas that emerged from it. So the book uh, is looking at different kinds of colonial processes trying to show how each of those processes has its own logic, but how these logics interrelate so that we get away from global histories that are that brush everything with, with one heavy brush stroke, but rather one in which we're able to see it, how different pieces are moving, uh, different dynamics are operating um, in, in, in different ways, but in ways that, that also intersect. That approach to uh, thinking about colonialism is of course also based um, on an ongoing discussion. I just want to name some names there. Uh, again, Lisa Lowe's work, Alyosha Goldstein's work, um, as well as Jody Bird, a variety of uh, scholars in critical indigenous studies, transnational American studies, who have taken uh, the study of colonialism increasingly in this direction. And I want to also mention that there's something I'm drawing on here from the way that Latinx scholars and uh, scholars of Latin America speak about coloniality. Um, pointing out that for far too long, uh, this claim that of some historians that colonialism is of the past and now we're in a quote unquote post-colonial present is in fact false. Uh, certain state forms of colonialism may have ended, but the processes of colonialism continue. And that's what certain scholars call coloniality. I just call it colonialism, but I'm drawing on those insights as well um, in this book. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question, which is, are you hopeful for decolonization in the 21st century with the rise of right wing power we have seen in the recent years? Speaking from Ireland, a country which is still separated by colonization, I'm not sure how it is possible to achieve this in the near future. What do people need to do to promote decolonization? Thank you so much uh, for that question. And um, 
I appreciate the solidarities that we are also naming in these questions, um, certainly in terms of uh, colonial, the colonial experience of Ireland, um, colonial resistance uh, in Ireland and decolonization um, as another very important hub in our story. Uh, and my perspective on this, uh, I would say, has shifted over the course of my study of this uh, topic, which is I, I, I don't actually believe that decolonization is waiting to happen. Uh, I really believe and see that decolonization is now, as much as it was in the past, as much as it will be to come. I don't think that there will be a time, in fact, in which the decolonizing struggle will um, cease and we will be in a period um, of, of it being over. I think that we will potentially, for a very long time, be in uh, the process of the social movement itself, of the practice itself of, of, of freeing ourselves, freeing our minds, freeing our communities, um, and, uh, and that, these, that contradiction between the ongoing presence of colonial power, um, which has its own kind of dimension to it, but also the ongoing process of, of decolonization, holding those pieces together and, and perhaps you know, inverting, inverting the story to say that, what happens if we ask the question, how much longer will colonialism or colonial forces keep fighting against the, the resurgence of decolonizing spirit, force, and power. For how much longer can colonialism itself hold out is, is an, as another way of kind of inversing, inverting that question. Because frankly, when we look at it, um, when we look at uh, the, the ways, and I speak about some of these examples in the book, um, beginning in the 1400s, uh, indigenous people through their performances um, through their the warfare that they were forced to carry out um, through their cultural practices and their writing, they were decolonizing. Um, in African descended peoples, even through the many failed emancipations and the many continuations of slave-like conditions, uh, continue to create opportunity space for uh, nourishment for learning, for art, for uh, the elevation of uh, the spirit, for black excellence and exuberance. And no wonder why today black art, African art, is one of the most um, evocative uh, wells, founts for, um, for the imagination, not just for African descended people, but for our world. And I think the, the same holds for indigenous folk. So, there are a variety of ways in which the story is quite complicated and in which um, decolonization is not waiting to happen. It has happened. Uh, it will continue to happen. Um, and uh, I, I, take great, um, I take great hope in that, great trust in that. And I, I'm thinking as I'm speaking of um, the work that's even taking place just right now, you know, this, these past weeks, just to name uh, some things that are happening in the Caribbean in terms of the reparations movement here in the United States and the reparations movement, uh, things that are taking place in the, in the UK around the environmental movement, the XR movement, um, the Black British movement. Um, I, I think we may look back on this 21st century and especially our experience of it now as uh, a moment of inflection um, when consciousness is really shifting in ways that that we may not have even anticipated a couple of years ago. That's that's what I believe. Yeah. So I think this is an exciting time to live, as much as it is, frankly, a frightening time uh, to be living in. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have another question for you. Um, so it says, "Thank you for this amazing talk. The point on the use of imagination to reclaim consciousness and perhaps harbor hope for the future is so powerful." Could you elaborate more on this point in terms of how it helps historians revision archives and read them in innovative waves, ways? For instance, how can one excavate and study imagination for cultures and human circumstances where colonized people could not leave written records? And how do you explain this point um, and historical methodology to your students? Thank you. 
Um, you know, I am a historian, uh, but I'm more than a historian. <laughs> I think I've, be I've had to become more than a historian because of my dissatisfaction, frankly, with the historian's methods. So I'm, I, I'm in the process of, of moving, moving to, a, to a new place, um, grateful for where I've been and for those methodologies, but knowing that they have their limits. Um, one of the great limits of uh, the historian's method is a conception of time in which there is something called time past, time present, and time future. And apparently we live in time present and it's, it's, it's after time past. That's just, you know, you can't write history in some ways without uh, taking that as a starting point. But there are so many other ways of knowing that are in the university system, but beyond the university, that we, that people, any, you know, wise people, people with insight know in which time past is not past and time present is not to come. You know, that, that we, are, we are in communication, in relation with different times um, in ways that are far more complicated than what the historian is trained to think or how the historian is trained to read the archive. So that's just a, a beginning to say that um, there, there is the, there's a question that you're asking, that I'm asking, which I think for historians is a potentially revolutionary question, and I hope it will revolutionize what history can be as we continue to decolonize this method. At the same time, there's something that um, scholars and, and scholar activists and wise people who are outside of this world of the historian, the, the, the trained historian, you know, already know and practice. I think of um, all of the performance studies scholars who think of the body itself as a form of the archive, um, who think of gesture as archiving the past. I think of, you know, the media scholars, the media uh, activists who uh, know uh, that what is, um, uh, what, uh, what is stored uh, is far more than what is, of course, written in, uh, you know, a, a, textual, uh, a textual archive. Of course, anthropologists have perspectives on this. And those anthropologists who are moving beyond the study even of the human community to, um, to looking at the relationships between human beings and other beings. So we're, we're at, a, at a wonderful moment, a revolutionary moment, I think, um, in our small place in the university in which we are uh, disrupting the very methods that have come out of colonialism itself. <laughs> which is so important because we need to free our minds. Um, and I see that work happening. Um, I wrote an article with a colleague called uh, uh, Global Humanities After Man, which if you just Google, uh, Global Comparative Humanities After Man. And if you just Google that essay, you know, it'll just give some more of the thinking that, that we had together about where we are and, um, questions about where we're going, but, but questions about curiosity, um, because as soon as we begin to challenge what we think of as the linear process of time, or we think of as the centrality of the, the human in the story, and who is that human anyways, uh, the sooner that we find new possibilities um, to narrate, uh, to know, uh, and through that narration to develop a different consciousness about where we are, who we are. Thank you. Uh, so I have a next question, um, which says, I was wondering about your observations on the interdependency and interactions in the processes of colonization and decolonization between socio-political and economic spheres of societies. Um, socio-political and what was the other word? Uh, socio-political and economic spheres of societies. Right. OK, I'll say that I'll respond to that very briefly um, to just say I, um, I, I see uh, a kind of interesting um, entanglement between these different spheres that were mentioned, the political, the economic, the social, the cultural, um, and the ways in which they, they track each other at times and ways in which sometimes they, they operate uh, it, it, you know, almost against the grain of the other. Um, but uh, one thing I, I think, uh, you know, my book is trying to do um, is to, to simply point out that um, looking at 
the economic alongside the cultural um, or looking at the social alongside the intellectual and the political. You know, taking these different dimensions and putting them together um, provides us with uh, some really fascinating ways to understand history and not to have to feel that our histories have to be cordoned off or sequestered into some of the boxes that we're, you know, that we're used to. Um, so I think I'll, I think I'll leave it, I think I'll leave it there. But, um, but yeah, crossing the boundaries of, of these kinds of divides uh, in the way we think of society um, makes sense because I think that's the reality of how society works, how we experience society as, as people. Thank you. Um, I have another question, which is, could you speak about the significance of formal decolonization in history and the significance of institutions such as the United Nations uh, and new horizons of consciousness regarding national self-determination that inform politics and culture from the early 20th century onward? Sure. Um, great question. And uh, I have a, a chapter in the book where I um, do speak about, uh, especially when I'm speaking about debt, I have a chapter on, on debt relations um, and finance, um, and especially in the 20th, 20th century. Uh, and that uh, chapter ends up um, speaking about the decolonizing moment and what happens after um, the rise of independent nation states, how debt relations, in fact, continue to track the relations of the empires that preceded as they do today in very important ways the debt load between the global north and the global south getting to the theme of the invisible colonialisms that um, still uh, define uh, the structures of our world so i i address that theme but then also look at forms of uh, again of resistance of, of decolonizing action um, which in this case uh, does relate to using institutions, international institutions like the UN to do the work against that system, uh, meaning the, the system ruled by the global north. It's a theme that comes up over and over in the book. Some forms of resistance take place, of decolonization take place outside the system. Some forms of decolonization take place from within the system. Uh, some, you know, take place around the system. And I think when we look at the histories that have emerged since the, uh, sorry, that have emerged since the 1950s and the 1960s, we see exactly that complexity, you know, that the nation states, post-colonial nation states themselves are often burdened by their own uh, constitutions, let alone by the corruption that uh, has followed because of the legacies of empire. Um, they are burdened with colonial force, colonial process, colonial mindsets, colonial elites. That, however, is not the whole story. Uh, and so over and over again, I'm interested in, in, in seeing where the decolonizing stories are hiding, witnessing those stories alongside the other story, which I do tell, which is what I call the kind of um, reiteration of colonial power. And there is certainly the case that colonial power has reiterated itself through uh, the structure of post-colonial nation states, uh, certainly. Uh, at the same time, those very states, and I think, for example, of what's happening um, just these past, this past month uh, in the CARICOM, in the Caribbean community, in which Caribbean states have taken a major step forward to ask uh, imperial uh, powers, uh, historical imperial powers like Britain and other uh, states in uh, Europe to come to a reparations conference. Here we have, you know, the, the post colonies asking or demanding of the post empire that they should meet at a table and they should have a conversation about remedy and repair. That's a form of decolonizing practice taking place from within the systems. Um, and of course, there are other stories that could be told from outside. So I think we have time for one last question, um, and that is, uh, I was wondering in terms of this colonial capitalism, is there any form of colonialism that does not involve, involve exploitation, or is, it co or is colonialism inherently destructive to the colonized people? 
Um, thank you. Um, I don't have a, a you know direct answer to that question, um, but I, I have a, a sideways answer, uh, which is to say, and it's something that I, I make clear in the book in the introduction, which is that there are multiple forms of colonialism, but the form of colonialism that the umbrella form that is the focus of my book um, is a, a one that we can define uh, and one that has a particular chronology to it. It was born in a particular context, in a particular time, um, and it relates to uh, racial capitalism and capitalist war and the rise of extractive economies drawing on uh, a Latin American economist, Celso Portado. Um, I speak of it as uh, a form of, of, of economy, of capitalist economy, in which the principle of profit maximization uh, seeks to penetrate deeper and deeper and deeper into the realm of life. That's a particular formulation. It's helpful you know, to think of, I think, in those terms. Um, and that kind of endless pursuit of extraction that endless pursuit of profit maximization is not everywhere or at all times. It emerged in a particular context, in a particular time, and it continues to be our haunting present. It continues into our haunting present. It continues to haunt our present um, because that, that kind of endless drive to extract and to dispossess without any real social rationality behind it is what we're battling against. That, in fact, in some ways is like the, the, the inner demon of, coloni of colonialism. Um, and it is also the inner demon that decolonizing practices uh, are, are contending with and are seeking to rid us of. Because after all, isn't, shouldn't our goal be peace, uh, sustainability, uh, our own preservation and the preservation of the life around us? Uh, how do we make that you know, the goal for our societies? as opposed to where we currently are, which is you know, the, 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 this kind of um, celebration of extraction and accumulation for its own sake. That's anti-social. What we need is a kind of social mindset. Um, and I think that these, these elements go together. The social, the idea of the community benefit, the idea of decolonizing practice, redistribution, shared goods, um, I think that's all there in the, the commons that we're trying to reimagine together.